When I was younger, each summer and almost every new year, my family would pack the car and go on a road trip to visit family in Mexico. We never had any problems until one particular trip when I was eight. Like every trip before, we left our home in North Texas around 6 p.m. in order to reach our destination the next morning. So around 2 a.m., we crossed into Mexico. Uh, that's when things got weird. When you're on the same stretch of freeway in the middle of the desert, you don't tend to freak out about having the same car behind you for miles. It was practically pitch black outside our car windows, the only visible shapes being the dotted stars and the eerie silhouettes of the cacti. We'd have been in Mexico for about an hour, and still had a few more to drive. I remember sleeping, but still being semi-conscious of what was around me, because I didn't have the skill to really fall asleep in a car. So, when my mother suddenly spoke my dad's name, I heard her. Miguel, the car behind us. It's been behind us since we left Loreto. My dad peeked at the car, shrugged off my mother's tension. A lot of cars use this road. He's probably going to Reynosa or another city. And he left it at that. Despite his sureness, my mom kept a weary eye on the car behind us. And by this time, my siblings and I were hyper aware of the car and entertained ourselves with watching the car through the two gaps in the luggage that blocked the rear window. We got tired pretty quick. He's getting closer, my mother noted. We turned to watch as the car inched closer and closer to ours. He's too close, Miguel. She was right. By this time, the car was practically pressed against the rear of our car, and only a lonely stretch of highway in the middle of nowhere with another few hours until daylight. It was downright scary. We couldn't do much. My dad didn't slow down, didn't stop, and he didn't speed away either. He just drove, and the car followed. The next 30 minutes were the most tense that we'd ever experienced. The car would ease off sometimes only to press its blinding headlights against our rear once more. Like he knew he was freaking us out and enjoying it. It was during one of the periods that the car had pulled away that my mom spotted a police car up ahead parked on the side of the road. Pull over, right in front of the police. Pull over right now, Miguel. And he did. The car kept driving. I wonder how confused the policeman must have been as he watched my dad park our car right in front of him. The policeman came over and asked us what was wrong. My mother urgently told him everything. The car, the way it followed us and taunted us. The policeman took her claim seriously and told us how people were victimized and had their cars stolen on empty highways by thugs and criminals. And then he offered to drive behind us for a while to make us feel safe. We drove off with the police cruiser behind us, relieved, until about ten minutes later, when we saw something that confirmed the policeman's words and my mother's worst fears. Ten minutes later, we saw the car pulled over on the side of the road, waiting. Now let me start by saying that, having spent my entire life living in New Mexico, a lot of people I know have claimed to have seen a skinwalker. They're kind of our regional boogeyman, but ask a Navajo about them and they will either absolutely ignore the question and all the following, or they will kind of laugh it off, saying something to the effect of, well, white people believe they are myths. Well, here's my story regarding them. My father owns a small delivery service that operates out of Farmington, New Mexico. We mostly deliver packages out to the middle of nowhere that are too much of a hassle for the larger delivery companies to bother with. My dad is the only employee and we have a few pickup trucks and a trailer. One day, we get a delivery out to Window Rock, Arizona, on the Navajo Reservation about two hours from Farmington. My dad gets the call for the job while he is chilling with his Navajo friend, Travis and his girlfriend. Travis mentions how he's got a family in Window Rock that he hasn't seen in ages and suggests they go with him. I was about six or seven at the time and it was the summertime, so dad decides we'll go down together. He could do his delivery really quick, then while Travis sees his family, we can go check out the window rock. We had to convoy in separate trucks since my dad was loaded down with freight. We decided to bring along some walkie-talkie so we could communicate with one another. We spend our time in window rock, 
Everything is generally uneventful and we start heading home along the old highway with my dad and I in front and Travis and his girlfriend in their truck behind us. I honestly don't remember most of the window rock trip but this next part I can never forget. We're somewhere on the highway between Window Rock and Gallup, New Mexico. It had just rained earlier in the day and the road was kind of slick so we were taking it pretty slow. On the left of the highway there is nothing but sandstone cliffs and on the right there is a huge field separated from the road by a small barbed wire fence. We crest the top of this hill and down at the bottom of the hill we see what appears to be a very large dog sitting back on its haunches in the middle of the road facing the cliffs. My dad calls over the radio. Hey, Trav, do you see that big-ass dog? Travis starts yelling back over the radio. That is not a dog. Speed up right now and hit it. He sounds almost hysterical. He just keeps screaming. Hit it, JJ. You have to hit it, please. Hit that fucking thing right now. So my dad starts to speed up, and as we get a bit closer, I can begin to see it a little more clearly. It's covered in this brown, wiry, matted hair that appears to have dried blood all over it. It's still facing the cliffs, but the moment our headlights hit it, it turns and looks at us, and it has a... a face. I don't know how else to describe it, other than a mix between a bear's and a human's face. It looks twisted and distorted and almost in pain. As we get closer to this thing, we start to realize it's actually fucking huge. Though it was still sitting on its haunches, it was about shoulder height with the hood of the truck. We get literally inches from hitting it when it lets out this scream that sounds like someone is screaming as their lungs were filling with water and it leaps backwards towards the field, landing just on the other side of the barbed wire fence. Then with another leap, it was gone from sight. Travis yells over the radio again, Holy shit, keep driving. We have to get out of here. We have to go faster. He kept repeating the last part. We have to get out of here. We have to go faster. Pretty soon we are speeding like crazy, and just as we start to come near the outskirts of Gallup, we get pulled over. Travis pulls his truck over with us. Naturally, this makes the cop, a Navajo man himself, very on edge and immediately asks why Travis felt the need to pull over as well. Travis says, We just saw a skinwalker a few miles back and it's following us. The officer immediately turns white, stammers something about a verbal warning, gets in his car and takes off. We do the same. We didn't see anything else that night, but when we got home, Travis refused to let us leave without taking some kind of Navajo totem thing that was supposed to keep it away. preface this, I want to say that last year I spent about 32 days in the woods, either scouting, hunting, or fishing. The year before that, I spent about 22 days. This doesn't include my regular hunts and camping adventures, which in the past three years adds up to just over 100 days. I've been hunting since I was nine, and have spent a lot of time outdoors in various parts of the US and in Canada. I've seen and heard a lot of strange shit but this takes the cake. I was in Kohata, North Georgia wilderness, for seven days scouting for bears, wild hogs, and deer, prepping for a hunting trip later that year. I had hiked about 10 miles, and then went off the trail for another three, five miles. Basically, I was out in the middle of nowhere. Since I was alone, I was using a hammock that has a built-in bug net, and I had a rain fly over it. I spent about three days halfway up a mountain, just looking for a good place to hunt. I saw three, four good-sized bears and ten hogs and came across some good-sized deer. On the fourth day, I was going to head down to a small stream that I had marked on my GPS and then set up camp, restock on water, and prep for the two-day hike back. I could have gone faster, but wanted to be able to look for any animal sign along the way. As I was approaching the small stream, I noticed a tent, which I was excited to see as I had been completely alone for a few days, and it's always nice to run into another hiker. Generally, us wilderness folks are pretty down to earth. As I got closer to the tent, I noticed that there was a small pack on the ground just outside of it. I figured the person couldn't have been too far from where the camp was, so I set up my camp about 30 yards away, 
and with about four hours of daylight left, I started cooking some dinner. Two hours later, I was starting to wonder where this person was, given that I was in the wilderness and it was about a one plus days hike out. There wasn't much I could do, but I did hike around the site, making a circle as I went out to look for any signs of struggle in case of a bear attack, or maybe they had an injury. I got about one fourth of a mile from the campsite, walking in a circle, but I didn't find anything. As night came, no one showed. I started a fire in hopes that the person would be able to find where they set up and have some light. Fires burn really bright and are very easy to see from far away. After cleaning, searching, and hoping that the person was going to make it back, I called in night. I had a small flask with me and took a couple of sips of whiskey, jumped into my hammock with my pistol, and attempted to go to sleep. I sleep pretty hard. <laughs> I mean really hard, regardless of where I am because I can always seem to fall asleep and stay asleep, regardless of where in the world we are. But this night was different. I felt like something was off, but I figured it was just me worrying about the person who, by all my accounts, was completely missing. So for the first time in my life, I woke up to the sound of what I thought was footsteps, but not in the sense of footsteps on leaves, but what a heavy-footed person would make walking on an old wood floor. It was extremely loud. I got my gun, grabbed my headlamp, stored in a small compartment up above me, and waited to see if it would stop. And right at that moment, it did. Then I saw something that scared the shit out of me. On my rainfly, the gleam of a flashlight, faint but there, I shouted, Hello? And right when I did, it sounded like ten people suddenly running away from me in every direction. I dropped out of my hammock onto the ground, frantically turning on my headlamp, shining it all around me, but I didn't see shit. My heart was racing pretty bad, but I thought it might have just been the reflection of the moon on the rainfly. Yeah, that, that was it, and those footsteps running away from me was probably armadillos or something, but even though their eyes shine, and they're pretty easy to spot, the problem was there was no moon. I'd never seen an armadillo above 2,000 feet. Not to say they don't live up here, just never seen one. And for some reason, the campsite I set up by was gone. The fire had been put out by water. It was apparent because there was no damn coal in the thing. I thought for sure it was about 4 a.m., but I had only been asleep about an hour. At this point, I wanted to leave, but hiking out in the wilderness while it's dark is always a bad idea. So I grabbed my flask took a swig of whiskey, removed my rain flyer so I could see out of the hammock and around the area I was in, tried my hardest to go back to sleep. I was lying down when I saw some light hit the trees above me. It was clear it was coming from downstream. I got out of my hammock and started yelling. Hey, you all need any help? No response. I saw whatever was putting out the light and it spun around and started heading downstream really fast. At this point, my body had pumped through more adrenaline than it had blood, and I was exhausted from it all. I was finally able to fall asleep and woke up around 7am. When I did, I noticed that my water filter I had left out was missing. It's a gravity filter, and it hangs on a tree filtering water down into my main bladder that I had put in my backpack. And the water bladder, sitting at the base of the tree, looked like it was cut down the middle with a knife. They cut down my bear bag, which had food in it and took some of it. The creepiest part of it all was that they went through my bag, which was under my hammock, while I was sleeping. I checked the bear bag before I went back to sleep the second time, and it was still there, hanging, and my bag under my hammock hadn't been touched. I packed all my shit and hightailed it out of there, keeping my pistol close to me, moving as fast as I could. I ended up making the hike back in just under 15 hours. I hiked the trail part in the night, because I wasn't able to spend another night out there. I didn't see anyone on my hike out. There were no cars parked at the trailhead, and the DNR said they had only seen my car there. Since then, I haven't gone out there without any friends. I reported all this to the local DNR, but they looked at me like I was crazy. Maybe I am. So, I used to live in a part of Memphis, Tennessee that was a little shaky, it was right on the edge of what some would call the ghetto, 
but also there was a nearby area that was pretty secluded and desolate as I lived on the outskirts of the city, kind of near the industrial part, near Rally for anyone familiar. Anyway, I was an eight-year-old boy when this happened and my sister was five years my senior. The two of us went for walks on occasion. This time we went to the back of the housing division and further than we'd gone before. This area was pretty dirty and desolate for such a city. Just train tracks and nearby industrial facilities. Lots of dry tan grass coming through spots in the railroad gravel. Lots of dusty crap people dumped illegally around the tracks. There used to be a pack of stray dogs that frequented my neighborhood, but other than that, no people or cars would really ever be seen out there. Not that far behind my neighborhood anyway. We were just walking along the tracks, talking, throwing rocks, when I saw some strange movement just beyond the tree line of the small wooded area, about 40 feet ahead of my 11 o'clock position. I told my sister to look as we walked a bit closer. We made it to about 10 or 15 feet away from this wooded area when we realized the movement was in fact a mime of all things, in the middle of nowhere seemingly hidden amongst the trees and thick dead vines that adorn the edge of the wooded area. Painted face, black striped shirt with black pants. He had the exaggerated expressions of a mime, too. His eyes got really wide and he seemed to start, I don't know, performing for us for a moment. He was kind of doing it in a way to, I guess, attract us? maybe entice us beyond that small wall of thick vines and brush and into the wooded area where he stood, or lurked, to be more precise. I honestly couldn't tell you much about him, as we ran away quickly. I do, however, remember that it was very hot outside that day, and his makeup was pretty dingy and gross, as were his clothes. I know this sounds pretty unbelievable, but I assure you it happened, Otherwise, it would be on no sleep. I sometimes wonder who that mime was. I'm sure he wasn't there to kidnap children, but who knows what would have happened if we'd gone into that thicket, and why there? He was just simply insane, I think. His mind was gone, which is far more creepy than any kidnapping stranger I have read about. When I was 19, I worked for a company that allocated labor to rural areas of Australia. Basically, what you did was tell them when you were available, and they'd send you to a remote farm for a few weeks where you'd do whatever they needed done. It was hard work and long hours, but good pay and good fun if you got in with a nice group of workers. And the property itself was about 40 minutes from the nearest town. In short, it was in the middle of nowhere. I was working at the farm clearing bushland with three other guys my age from the city. Our boss was a guy called Jeremy who owned the farm and supervised us while helping out with the work. He was pretty laid back and was generally really good to us. This summer in particular was very hot and the work was hard, so one day when the temperature hit about 38 degrees Celsius, Jeremy decided to give us the afternoon off. He said he knew of a water hole on the farm about a 25-minute drive north. I was keen for a swim, but the other guys just wanted to relax for the Arvo, so him and I hopped in one of the work trucks and started heading across the property. It was mostly wide, empty expanses with a few clumps of scattered bushland. Jeremy wasn't much of a talker, so we drove more or less in silence. After about 20 minutes, however, he suddenly perked up and jabbed me in the ribs, do you see that over there, beneath the two dead trees? I should mention here that if you're not familiar with the inland areas, particularly those in Australia, they are brown or red, and mostly flat and bland, meaning any bright colors stick out like a sore thumb, so you can imagine our surprise when we could see a large blue angular structure far off in the distance. We steered in its direction, and as we got closer, we realized it was a huge blue shipping container just sitting in the middle of nowhere. Jeremy was perplexed. I asked him if he knew what it was, but he obviously didn't. He said he hadn't seen it when he drove through the same area about five weeks before, and he wanted to go and see what it was. 
Initially, we pulled to a stop about 100 meters away from it. At this stage, I had a really bad feeling. The whole thing wasn't right. It's hard to explain, but if you can imagine seeing such a foreign object in the middle of a huge barren expense, it had to be something weird. Jeremy, however, wanted to investigate, which I understood, given it was his property, but in truth, I was really anxious. As we got closer, things got even more bizarre. There was a big diesel generator behind it thumping away, and a CCTV camera on each side, all motion activated so they buzzed from side to side, following us as we moved around. I tried to reason with Jeremy, something along the lines of, with all this security, someone obviously doesn't want us here, let's just go. He brushed me off, however, reminding me it was his farm and whoever had put this here was trespassing, so we wanted to go inside. Despite all the surveillance, there was only a small padlock on the huge door. We had some bolt cutters in his toolbox, and after a bit of a struggle, we broke the lock and went inside. The first thing I noticed was the rush of cold air as we got in. The place was air-conditioned, which I must admit was quite pleasant on such a hot day. We searched around for a light switch, but I could already see this was some sort of IT setup. There were flashing LEDs all around the place, and the sort of hum you hear when a hard drive is working hard. When we finally switched on the lights, we could see a sophisticated office setup. There were hard drives the size of bar fridges and other computer equipment lining the walls, sometimes piled two or three high, and plastic storage boxes scattered around the far wall, and several desks with computer monitors arranged in the middle, complete with rolling office chairs. At this stage, I felt like I was in one of those nonsensical dreams. This made absolutely no sense. We wandered to the middle and sat down at the desk to see if the computers could give us any idea of what the hell was going on here. My heart was racing and I just wanted to bolt. We had been seen by the CCTV, so if anyone was monitoring, they already knew we were here. Jeremy, on the other hand, was adamant we had to get to the bottom of this, so I put on a brave face and started looking through the computer. This went on for a while, but in short, neither of us had a very high grasp of technology outside of Facebook and Microsoft Word. The best I can describe it from my position is that it was endless list of computer talk. It was like the old Napster or LimeWire download screens looked like, just constantly picking up and receiving data then recording it on several windows. I gave up on the computers and walked cautiously over the far end of the container to the big pile of storage boxes. By then, I was pretty sure no one else was there as there was nowhere to hide, really, but I was still incredibly on edge. I decided, against my better judgment, to see what was inside all these boxes. My brief sift through this box still makes me feel sick to my stomach. It didn't take long for me to realize that the box was full of posters, DVDs, and photos, all of hardcore child pornography. One thing that still gets to me is that it was all neatly ordered into folders and smaller boxes. These people were organized. I immediately recoiled, jumped up and ran over to Jeremy. I could hardly string a sentence together. I said something to the effect of, Mate, get up. Child sex. Go. Get the fuck up. I dragged him out, composed myself, and managed to explain what I saw. We jumped back into the truck and sped back to the house. The farm had no mobile phone reception, and we hadn't bought the satellite phone so we had to get back to the landline to call the police. Once we called them, they still had to make it all the way to the farm from the nearest police station, which was in a town about a half hour from the town closest to the farm. We waited, talking frantically about what we'd seen, until the cops arrived almost an hour later. They arrived with two four-wheel drives, and we jumped in and led them back. This is where it gets worse. By the time we got back, the container door was open and there was a fire inside. We had only two small extinguishers in the cars, and these did very little. The fire department took an hour to get there, by which stage most of the damage was already done. An arson report by the federal police found almost no evidence of the computer equipment described, and only traces of paper and cardboard. This means that whoever ran it knew we were there and had time to come and remove most of it and get away. 
There were various ways to get off the property and the landmass was huge, so there was no real way to tell them. Since the police hadn't taken us at all seriously in the first place, probably due to our poor explanation on the phone, aerial surveillance was also impossible by the time we had pieced it all together. I took a keen interest in following it up, but with no real evidence of who might be responsible, the investigation went cold. I've kept in contact with Jeremy, and the shipping container is still sitting there on the farm, as it's too expensive to move. I'll never forget what I saw in those boxes. Hey guys, thank you all for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit that subscribe button and join the Nightmare Army. I'm always looking for new soldiers in my Nightmare Nation. So of course, I want to thank the Dark Somnium Narrations for helping me out with this video. Thank you so much, man. And if you guys haven't, please check out his channel. And even a cooler plus, he also makes his own music for his videos too, which is pretty awesome. So go check him out, and I guarantee you, you guys will like him. So how's everybody doing? I hope everybody has a really great Friday and a good weekend. Uh, for me, I feel like half the week I've spent narrating and watching Shameless on Netflix and playing Assassin's Creed. <laughs> I swear to God, I mean, I used to um, chat with a lot of my friends on um, uh, some kind of like Discord server and whatnot or on PSN. And uh, for like the past like couple of weeks, I've just been completely absent from like all of those. And I've just been watching uh, Shameless and it's... <laughs> Everybody's just like, Joe, man, are you alive? Where are you? And I'm like, yeah, sorry, man. I'm just addicted to Shameless, which, by the way, has anybody really watched that show at all? Because that is a pretty funny show. I mean, I never really gave it the time or day, but one day I was just like, oh, whatever. Let me just watch it. Maybe it'll be good. I swear to God, though, the one episode where if anybody does watch the show, I'm not really spoiling anything, but um, there's one episode where the dad, Frank, decides to fake his own death so that way he can get rid of some mobsters that want his money. And I love the scene where he just comes in and he goes, which one of you guys have wanted me dead? And like, they all like raise their hands. I flat out died laughing. I was laughing so freaking hard. <laughs> but anyways, guys, as always, thank you all for watching. And just remember, the best ideas always come out of nightmares.